Hello everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you might be. My name is Peter Lamantia. I'm the CEO of Authentic Web. We're a corporate domain registrar and DNS service provider located in Toronto, Canada. I formed this company in 2015. And the reason I did it is because I used to be the president of a registrar and part of a Fortune 1000 company. And domains just drove me crazy. Even though we were a registrar, we just could not get our hand on, hand on them. So we built some tools to make it easy for IT teams to get and keep control of this. And as we dug into it, we started looking at the security and the compliance side of it and recognized that there are some serious issues on the external DNS that needed to be resolved. So we're going to share that with you today, and I hope you get some value from it. As an agenda, we're going to look at domain security and DNS network security and understand those differences. We're going to look at some research that shows the frequency and business impacts are just increasing. We're going to look at these external DNS audits, why these conditions exist, what the risk implications are, and the best practice recommendations for you to think about in your own organization. We'll even look at see what's going on inside the enterprise, and I think you'll recognize yourself in a lot of these processes. Then we'll do a summation on how to solve it. We know that domains and DNS are vulnerable to compromise. Why is it so difficult to get and keep control? What policies and control systems need to be put in place to protect your business and keep your com company safe? Why is DNS security critical? DNS is the single most critical technology on which the entire digital business depends. Everything runs on the DNS. From the website you visit, the email you send, the click you make, the link over to another website, everything is run and depends on the DNS. And virtually all cybersecurity incidents start with the DNS. Even if it might be the first phase to find some credentials by sitting on a connection that's insecure, everything runs on the DNS and the bad guys know that and they can see the DNS the same way that we can access all websites, they can access and map your network to find the vulnerabilities. So you need to lock it down with policies and systems or you're going to get burned. It truly is the classic, not if, but when. And in fact, it's happening right now and you just don't know it. So when we think about cybersecurity, the old tactic was to spend millions of dollars and, and tons of man months in protecting the perimeter. Well, there is no perimeter anymore. Everything runs out in the external DNS up in the cloud with your cloud providers and also your customers. They're all sitting out there and they're all dependent upon the external DNS to operate. That's also where the bad guys are. And what they can do with great tools is to find vulnerable connections, sit on them, wait and discover and harvest data and credentials to plot and plan and execute their cyber attack on your business. Let's talk about domain security and DNS security and the differences. Well, domain security is pretty simple. It's really just domain security, registrar lock, registry lock, two-factor or single sign-on access. This is really security to protect your domains themselves. It is not DNS security. DNS security is a whole other beast that starts with domain security. But it also includes policies and the enforcement of those policies. It covers end-to-end -end HTTPS encryption whether it's on the certs themselves or on secure redirects. Secondary DNS and the SPF, DMARC, DNSSEC, and CA records, all of these need to be controlled and set up with automation. You also need change management workflow control. Who's changing what and when and was it approved? You need compliance monitoring to ensure that your DNS security policy is being enforced. And you have to have an audit history. We need to understand what changed and for compliance purposes to understand, to prove 
that you have complete control over every edit that has happened on your DNS network. And finally, role-based permissioning. You want to be able to give everybody access to see data, to do their jobs, to understand what's going on. But only certain individuals should have permissions to make edits to anything on your DNS. So those are two important pieces of security that, that you need to understand and be able to protect yourself. So let's have a look at some of this research. So the scale and severity of DNS compromises continues to escalate. We see it in the news and have for a few years. DNS hijacks, orphan domains. We saw the spammy bear attack where entire country codes were compromised. And we've seen DNS hijacking that's targeting companies at an unprecedented scale. So much so that the Department of Homeland Security in the United States and the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK issued warnings to organizations to pay attention and lock down their, their controls over their DNS. And recently, in June of 2021, IDC, in association with Efficient IP, conducted a study and reported that DNS-based attacks are continuing across the board and increasing across the board. They showed that the average cost of an attack is $950,000 and that 87% of organizations suffered one of these attacks as opposed to 79% in 2020. So as the attack surface area increases, organizations are suffering more types of diverse attacks than ever before. Cyber criminals are exploiting both the DNS protocol, which is by design, not very secure, and susceptible to misconfigurations. Just recently, I saw this article that talks about phishing as a service from Microsoft. What's interesting here that it proves a point that we're going to talk about with SPF and DMARC. The attacker compromised the company's own domain name and started using it for phishing using subdomains. And the company didn't even know about it. So when we get into the audit, I wanted to first discuss how we do this. So the audits are conducted using all publicly available information. The results are point in time that's dependent upon the condition of the host servers at the time of the response. So audits are executed only at the apex level for each domain. So when you look at these audits, they're really indicative of a larger network conditions, since there are many records on subdomains or other types of records. So these audits represent only the tip of the iceberg. To really understand, you need to dig into the entire zone file and run an audit on, on that entire database. So what we did is we took 11 enterprises across six verticals that hold an aggregate of about 21,000 domain names. And we gave them a look. So here are the results. First of all, we saw multiple domain registrars. It's a condition that exists because of un unconsolidated acquisitions, or it could be because of legacy IT or intellectual property team preferences over time, or even rogue actions of guys inside the organization. So if you have two or three or four registrars, that's not too bad. But when you're getting into six and eight and 13 different registrars, there's just no way that you can maintain control over that DNS footprint. It makes it impossible for teams to view it, to manage it, because there is no single control environment, or there's no integrated change management process to ensure DNS network security policies. So the risk impact here is from anywhere from low to quite high, depending upon how many you have in place. So the best practice here is to consolidate to one or maybe two registrars if you seek redundancy in your vendor. Ensure those selected registrars are fully integrated control systems for domain and DNS security, compliance, and performance. We then looked at managed DNS services. And this, frankly, shocked me. Every time we do this, it shocks me. Companies have literally dozens of live managed DNS services on their domain portfolios. That's an impossible situation to manage. It shows evidence of years of inattention. 
past preferences, mergers and acquisitions, and also an internal perception of risk and avoidance and lack of the need to consolidate. I just think they don't want to. But you need to if you want to maintain control and security, a good security posture. Because this condition makes it impossible for teams and does not allow for oversight controls, lack of unified control systems or change management oversight. DNS hijacking is increasingly a common attack vector. Who has access to these systems? What passwords are being used? Are the passwords shared? And in these cases, resource records can be changed at any time without authority or without knowledge. This is an extremely risky situation. So our best practice is consolidate, enforce change management control function, ensure security and regulatory compliance against external threats, and internal actor actions, errors, and omissions. We've seen from many reports that one of the top attack vectors is from insiders. IP address hygiene. <clears throat> when we look at the number of domains and the number of IPs that are represented in those domain names, it's pretty extraordinary. So it is an indicator again of poor DNS hygiene. Endpoint servers are untended or forgotten. They become orphaned. And when third-party cloud service may be turned down, the DNS record remains and server control is lost. So having dozens or hundreds of IPs does not necessarily constitute a risk or a hygiene issue if and only if the servers are known and managed. However, it's more common that many of these servers are no longer under enterprise control. And this exposes the company to brand and service impersonation risk. Or worse, if some of those servers may still have connections to other parts of the network to allow entry in unpatched servers for bad guys to transit inside your network. So what you need to do here is establish systems to bring visibility to live IPs in your DNS. The key here is to make it easy for the IT team to execute DNS hygiene routines. And now you can set policies and process to enforce that DNS hygiene. HTTP response hygiene. A high percentage of these domains are not resolving. So that indicates poor DNS hygiene where no records, where records have been orphaned. And the, there are also cases where, no name, where name servers are not responding at all. So they may be defensive registrations and you don't want anything to resolve but it could also indicate that there are no start of authority records. And without a start of authority record, you're exposed to, the, to that domain being hijacked. So risk here is ranges from low to high. It depends what's running. It depends if you have start of authority records. So again, you need to establish systems to make it easy for IT to conduct these zone reviews and figure out which of these domains can bring traffic and SEO benefit to the business. Ensure that all domains include an SOA record at a minimum. Secondary DNS. So when you look at the provisioning of secondary DNS across these businesses, it's not very strong. And we think that's largely due to an ignorance on the need. And this is changing as we're increasing incidents of DNS networks themselves being targets of DDoS. And a lack of secondary DNS is a business continuity risk to DDoS incidents on these networks. Of course, it's not needed if there's no DDoS, but if a DDoS hits and the primary DNS network goes down, you go down. With secondary DNS on a diverse network, your digital presence stays alive and you didn't even notice it. It's a really low cost protection to ensure you stay alive. So you need to establish automation systems here to slave secondary DNS from primary. Again, it's really low cost and it's a bit of a no brainer in my view, as we start to see more DDoS happening all the time. SPF and DMARC coverage. So you can see a fairly wide mix here. And you can see this third from the bottom, the financial services company that are now up to 
you know, 51 and 55% on SPF and DMARC respectively. We've been watching these guys for a, for a year or so, and they're doing a really good job. Their coverage is improving consistently. So SPF and DMARC records adoption varies widely, but they but you need to establish these records where mail is used and also where it's not used. This is what I think the misconception is. Today it's only used where there's mail. Nefarious actors who target your organization can execute phishing attacks using your own domains where they're not covered by SPF and DMARC. And this was the point of that article that was published on the Microsoft research. So establish the security policy with enforcement and with enforcement systems to ensure SPF and DMARC are set up on all domains. Even if they're simple brand protection domains, you need to ensure that they cannot be used for phishing attacks against your own business or your own customer base or partners. DNS sec adoption is really low in the companies that we audited. At the same time, and I'll share it in a minute, research is showing that adoption is growing rapidly, especially in the last couple of years. But low adoption is due to the complexities and the work effort. And in some view, the risk of setting up DNSSEC that could impact the performance of the, your digital footprint itself. But it's largely related to the work effort and keys that they must be rolled annually to maintain that chain of trust. And without DNSSEC, these bad actors can flood target recursive servers anywhere on the internet to insert false DNS records or DNS cache poisoning to redirect that traffic to malicious websites. So our view, establish DNSSEC with automation tools to ensure DS records are set on resolving domains, ensure systems include automation to roll those keys, and importantly, monitor them daily for compliance. Here's some of this research I mentioned from VeriSign Labs. And you can see here that adoption first started in mid-2012 and really sort of steadily increased fairly slowly, but then suddenly in early 2020 and now into 2021, um, the adoption is exploding. People are recognizing that DNS hijacking through DNS cache poisoning is becoming a big problem. And I think you're gonna see this continue as we go forward. I like this comment from this third party researcher who said, DNSSEC may join TLS or SSL certificates in becoming an implicit requirement expected by the end users and digital services. And I think this is true. We also looked at HTTPS and the requirement here is for end to end HTTPS. It's clearly a security imperative. So as we conduct these audits, what we see are a lot of hops from HTTP to HTTPS. However, we can't know with certainty how the infrastructure teams have provisioned their environments. So we've chosen to leave this data out to not to be misleading. But what we can state definitively is that HTTP redirects exist in large numbers. We just can't know exactly how it's done unless they're a client of ours. So the implication here is that insecure redirects create a security gap to allow these bad actors to get in the middle of conversations and or redirect users to nefarious sites. The recommendation, ensure all your redirects are secure redirects. You need to use system to provision the certificates and system should automate certificate renewals as well. A company will have hundreds or thousands of redirects depending upon the, the size of the portfolio and coverage can only really be done with automation. I hope that was helpful. I'm going to give you a little bit of a summary here. So we know that DNS audits reveal these gaps. We can see it. There's security gaps, hygiene gaps and compliance control issues. The apex audits are indicative, so remember that. This is really tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more work to do in the full zone files. And research independent is increasingly showing the frequency and the impacts are growing. It's an important area that you need to get under control. And the impacts are pretty diverse. 
So customer distrust or churn, regulatory compliance fines in cases of breaches, reactive work effort and cost. When an incident happens, it costs a lot more to be reactive than it does to be proactive and lock down your network in the beginning. P&L and brand damage, as well as career damage. If this is your area and you've not got it under control, people are gonna ask questions, why not? So why does this problem persist? I think there's a belief that IT has it locked down. There's also a lack of ownership and expertise that's consistent across the organization. The C-level doesn't really understand this. There's kind of a complacency as well. DNS always used to be set it and forget it, but that's changing now. These unseen risks aren't known, but they're there. I think there's also a sense that it's messy. They don't want to open it up. They know it's a um, you know, difficult area, but it doesn't have to be because in the past, there weren't very many control systems. Now there are, so you can get this under control if you so choose to. So what's going on inside the enterprise? And this is where I think you'll see yourself and what's going on and how your organization is pretty, probably fairly consistent with other organizations that we talk to. It used to be easy. One domain, one registrar, one, re one DNS service, a C-level and an IT person, set it up, set up an A record, set up a MX record, and you've got a website and your mail and you're off and running. That's pretty easy. Don't need to do much more than that. Even when we got to 10 domains, 50 domains, not so bad. But now companies have hundreds and thousands of domain names, many registrars, and even more DNS services. And stakeholders come from every department and part, and part of the organization. From the brand people, the IP, IT, digital product marketing, everybody has a, is a stakeholder in domains and DNS. But often there's a lack of centralized control and ownership over the entire process. Companies own a lot of domains. Why so many? We know trademarks, products, programs, partnerships, local market needs, brand protection, mergers and acquisitions add a lot. So we know this and business is digital and digital runs on the DNS. So you need to lock this down and get better control over it. It's pretty clear. When taken for granted, bad things are going to happen here. So the root cause here is related to silos. And in silos, I mean both system silos, as we've seen already in registrars and DNS providers, but also organizational silos, different operating entities throughout the business. And it's people, it's dependent upon people. Now people intend to do good work, but they don't always. And nobody owns this problem holistically across the industry, or across the business. So inside a business, Somebody needs something, so they want to place an order, they want to change something. So organizations have ticketing systems. They may use email threads, forms to request something be done. And that goes to a team of people who then register a domain name or make an edit in a registrar system. It could be one of many. And then we need the IT guys involved to set up the, the records in the DNS. And again, it could be one of many, depending on what part of the business you're working in or the flavor of the year on the DNS, um, but how do you know everything is done correctly? DNS analytics, often only on flagship domains, core domains that operate most of the business, and that information is then requested and changes start to happen again. But all of these systems are disconnected. And the security policies, this is a team that may set a DNS security policy, but how do they enforce that across all of these different systems? It's nearly impossible. And then of course we do zone reviews. Periodic, human resource intensive. This is really difficult. Something happens, somebody recognizes, we need to do a zone review because we're exposed. So we get a high-end um, IT person, DBA, DNS expert to pull all the zones, review them, and tell us what we need to do. But they don't necessarily know. They need to talk to the business. Do you need this live? Do you need that live? What's this for? I've never seen it before. Who did that? Well, it might have been 
two people before I was even in this chair. So what happens is work effort is done to try to do a zone review and clean things up, but it never gets to end of task. And two weeks later, some other priority comes along and it's left and the problem persists. There's a similar issue with portfolio reviews. I used to experience this. Every quarter I'd get a stack of paper on my desk. We owned about a thousand domain names. And they'd say, well, should we, which one of these do you want to renew? And I would look at it and I would say, well, what's running on these? And the person would say, I don't know. So then we'd have to go back to the DB to run an analysis. And I'd say, that's not worth it. She's doing all sorts of other work we need her to do. So just spend the $15, $20 and renew the domain name. So it just persists and it gets worse over time and over decades. This is what we see in most businesses. So there's really a lack of systems related also to a lack of policies. So I like to ask three questions. I say, okay, do you have a unified tamper-proof system to manage domains in DNS? By example, can someone change a zone without permission? Do you know when it changes and who changed it? The implication is you have unforeseen errors, rogue actions that expose the bid's business or could impact digital performance. Secondly, can you prove that system enforces security policies and change management? What ensures the SPF or SSL certificates are implemented as required? Do you have an audit trail? Do you know they did it? And failing is failure to comply with IT controls. You don't have an audit. You don't know what's going on. You've got a gap in your DNS security enforcement side. And then lastly, is this system integrated with registrar and managed DNS controls. For example, are new domain additions and changes connected to the DNS system? If you don't have end-to-end -end change management compliance due to silos increased work effort, you don't have control and you're exposed to compliance issues and inability to address security enforcement. So let's sum this up and think about how to solve it. I always think of this in sort of four bullet points. So first of all, domains in DNS are extremely vulnerable to compromise. We've seen this already in the research and there are tons of external threats out there from social engineering and one of the services you're not paying attention to, CA compromises, DDoS, man in the middle, DNS and domain hijacks and phishing. All of these threats are out there and happening all the time. And the problem persists because it's really hard for IT teams to get and keep control. And these are because of internal issues. We, whoops, we see key exchange, errors and omissions, manual processes, all sorts of issues related to oversight and visibility, silos as we've spoken about, lack of change management controls and personnel turnover. If someone is really savvy on the DNS and they leave, where is that institutional knowledge? Well, it's gone. And it's all of these issues and problems that you need to solve with systems to bring it all into one place. So the solution here is to establish your DNS security policies and enforce that with digital control systems. The key here is you're bringing it all together. You're bringing together the workflow, the DNS, the access controls, the DNS security policies, the domain names and the TLS certificates into one place. And by that, you can maintain control, visibility and automation to enforce your security policies and manage this more effectively. And frankly, just make it easy for your IT teams who now they don't stand a chance. And the fourth point here, and this is the good news, is that automation systems pay for themselves. Over the years since we first registered that first domain name, the cost of managing domains and DNS and TLS certificates have just exploded. It continues to grow and will continue for the foreseeable future unless something changes. But when you put in systems, you reduce your total cost of ownership. And you do that because you make things easy and you tie it all together into one place and you automate certain processes. An example here would be DNSSEC. We've set up DNSSEC to be a toggle button. You click the toggle button, 
it creates the records. It passes it to the registries and poof, you're set up at DNSSEC. And then one year from now, those keys will automatically roll. That is orders of magnitude more, more efficient than having a person go in and create keys, copy keys, transfer them over, and remember in a year to come back and to sort those through. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you learned something today. I'm expecting you probably saw yourself in a lot of these charts. I'd ask you, I invite you to reach out if you have questions or to learn more about how to solve these risks for your organization. I'd also invite you to go visit our resource section on our website. We, we have a number of different webinars and white papers and blog posts that explain some of the DNS security issues that you might be interested in. Thank you very much and I hope you have a great day.